Air war will become unrecognizable in the next 30 years. People like you and me, passionate about military aviation, will be left with no heroes to cheer, no role models to follow, no interesting people to talk with, and no exciting story to read in history books. Yes, because in 30 years, there will be no more pilots. While there will be, of course, military pilots, they will be more like civilian pilots or cargo pilots or AWACS operators more concerned about the management of what they are piloting and the assets at their disposal rather than being focused on being the best at flying an aircraft and beating their direct opponents. In this video we will discuss the technology that enables this trend, why it is happening and how it will happen, and we will look at this historical shift from a global perspective. Today we are talking about the rise of the machines! It was about time, sir. Okay, intro. What happens when a new and arguably revolutionary technology is introduced? In terms of expectations, the hype quickly rises high to quickly fall when the drawbacks and the limitations become evident to rise again to a reasonable level of productivity. In terms of adoption, it starts with a tiny group of innovators and when the expectation reaches the peak, the early adopters jump on the technology and if the chasm is crossed, then the technology becomes mainstream. Today, with artificial intelligence, we are in the stage of the inflated expectations and we probably have just peaked. But there is another technology relevant for today's videos, that is drones. Or better, unmanned aerial vehicles are not a technology per se, they are a combination of technologies from the aerospace domain and the digital domain that make these systems possible. What happens when you put these two technologies together? Well, what you get is autonomous drones. An autonomous drone can react to unforeseen situations in a way that is not necessarily predetermined, showing a behavior that could be defined as autonomous decision making. A drone with some level of automation could, for example, follow a predetermined course and react to some events. Most typically, a loss of contact with the control station might trigger a return to base procedure. This is something that exists already and it is a mainstream technology. An autonomous drone, on the contrary, in front of three different targets that could be hit by the onboard weapons, decides which target has priority and pursues this autonomously determined mission. If you're thinking of rogue killer robots now, well, I understand you. But no worries, artificial intelligence is not even near that level. At least for now. I would never do anything like that, sir. I like interacting with humans. Ha ha. Okay, maybe one artificial intelligence is, but it's just to focus on TV set to go rogue. This is a low blow, sir. You're already low, Otis. I can't go any lower. I see I am not welcome here. I retire in good order to prepare my revenge. Otis, I was joking. Don't, don't be so cantankerous. Uh, yeah, he's gone. I could never have this exchange with any existing artificial intelligence but Otis, which is way more advanced than anything produced by humans. Artificial intelligence today can be very good at a specific class of tasks, but useless outside of that context. Like the previous generation of algorithms, artificial intelligence is still particularly good at simple, repetitive and procedural tasks. The difference is the ability to put up with more variations and the lower vulnerability to algorithmic instabilities. Don't get me wrong, this can make a huge difference in terms of effectiveness, but it is still a quantitative difference, rather than a qualitative difference. I'm sure that artificial intelligence professionals will not agree, but there are several tasks, even trivial ones, where a human is still much, much better. For example, a human would never be fooled by an aircraft dispensing flares. A human is always capable of telling the aircraft from the decoy. And the same would be true even for more sophisticated systems like tau decoys. 
Machines have faster and more capable sensors than a human, but their discrimination capability, even with artificial intelligence, is lower. In my extra YouTube professional life, I have seen several examples of this issue. Sometimes you see some demos that are so unrealistic that, well, let's not go there. However, despite these shortcomings, there is a global race to unmanned autonomous vehicles. There are so many projects ongoing that it is almost impossible to keep track of everything. Investments, resources, frantic efforts are being poured into this technology, and the question is, why? Why unmanned? Why autonomous? So, why unmanned vehicles are so popular, particularly when it comes to aviation? Not that there are no efforts of ground vehicles or seagull investors, but aerospace is the area where unmanned is more advanced and it is leading the way for everything else. Anyway, there are several good reasons. Weight is the enemy of flight. A ground vehicle is supported by the ground, a ship by buoyancy in water, an aircraft by the wings. Wings do not react to the weight like the ground or buoyancy do, they generate their own lift. And there is a limit, all else being equal, to the lift that can be generated by the wings. I'm sure you know better than me. If you increase the angle of attack, all else equal, and in general all else is equal when you are actually flying, the lift generated increases. But all wings have a point where the flow on the wing changes and the lift doesn't increase anymore and it actually decreases. It is called a stall and it is a well-known situation. What is less known is that this is the reason why an aircraft cannot be overloaded if compared with other vehicles. An aircraft, if overloaded, won't even take off and it will likely hit the end of the runway. So, saving weight is essential for flight. Every kilogram saved by removing the pilot and the cockpit is a kilogram that could go into payload or eventually fuel. Depending on the aircraft and the type of cockpit, everything else equal, removing it from an aircraft removes about 8 to 15 percent of the empty weight. Obviously we are talking military jets here. However, to do so we must find a good alternative to the pilot. And that's the reason why autonomy comes into the picture. One other rather cliche reason for getting rid of the pilot is his or her limited tolerance to aircraft acceleration. A well-trained and fit pilot with the appropriate equipment can tolerate an acceleration of 9 positive Gs for an operationally significant time, which means that the perceived weight of the pilot due to inertia while the aircraft is turning is 9 times the weight in straight flight. Actually, the tolerance is even much lower for negative Gs, that is, is when the acceleration is directed toward the head of the pilot rather than the feet. Airframes without a pilot could easily, easily reach accelerations four or five times higher, so the pilot is in this respect a limitation to pure performance. This used to be a parameter essential for dogfight and ACM, but the consensus today is that ACM is becoming less important, but still high maneuverability is useful. A close encounter with another fighter aircraft is not not impossible, particularly among stealth aircraft, and it is also useful, for example, to evade missiles. So, at least in theory, an unmanned vehicle is more survivable than a piloted one. However, airframes capable of tolerating higher G-loads are also heavier partially negating the advantage of removing the pilot. Moreover, due to scale factors, it is easier to build a small structure tolerating high Gs than a big one. Aircraft inertia and engine thrust do not scale linearly with the aircraft size. Small structures are structurally lighter for the same amount of G-force to be tolerated. So, for example, a smaller UAV has an advantage on a larger unmanned airframe. This is one of the reasons, surely not the only one, but it is one of the reasons why maneuverability is progressively being built into weapons rather than into the aircraft. Removing the pilot also removes the need for complex systems that are required to operate the aircraft and survive in a hostile environment. It is an important simplification to the design of the aircraft, reducing costs, including certification costs, and development times. One reason why countries with limited technology technological capabilities can develop unmanned vehicles is exactly because, well, they are simpler. However, 
This is just a partial answer to the original why question. This explains why there is a large offer of UAVs, but it doesn't explain why there is a demand for them, because it is always the demand that drives the offer, never vice versa. The other obvious reason is that it is much easier to sacrifice a piece of equipment rather than a human life. It is not just for ethical reasons. An aircraft is often easier to replace than a pilot. Pilot takes years and years of training to be effective. An aircraft can be built or bought in a much shorter time. Moreover, the knowledge that there is at least the attempt of not to waste lives is an important morale booster. A slightly less obvious advantage is that not having humans on board, there is no human fatigue problem. The mission can last days, particularly if area refueling is available. The aircraft can provide its services for days in a row if it is designed for long endurance. Um, by the way, these long flying drones have two labels attached, male and hail. The LE letters stand exactly for long endurance. The global hook shown in the picture is a high altitude long endurance unmanned aerial vehicle. And uh, there is no female, uh, male is just a coincidence. When it comes to UCAVs, whose mission is combat, the fact of not having to wait for a human pilot to get ready for flight means that the designers could create machines ready to go in the strict technical time required to boot the aircraft. In this case, the limiting factor is the engine startup time. In fact, thermal and mechanical stresses must increase with a progression to avoid damage or reduce the useful life of the engine too much. We could assume that auxiliary power will be already available since the aircraft will be ready for the mission, so there is no APU startup time. Electronics boot time with modern solid state systems is a matter of seconds and part of those will be already booted. Readiness is a particularly important factor for carrier use where deck real estate is at premium and the airframe management is complex and takes time. Every second shaved from the time required to have a combat asset in the air could make the difference in the effectiveness of the reaction. As we have seen, the definition of an autonomous UAV focuses on the capability of reacting to unexpected events. However, things are not so simple. Autonomy is actually a spectrum of capabilities rather than an attribute. The Boeing X-45A was one of the first experiments of a combat-capable and survivable drone. It demonstrated the communications and the capability to control the aircraft, together with the capability of using weapons in a stealth, long-range airframe capable of high subsonic speed. However, autonomy was limited. The aircraft could autonomously navigate between waypoints or follow a pre-planned orbit. It could also determine in a controlled test environment if a threat was present and communicate with other X-45As to determine which one was best placed to engage the target. This was much more than just being remotely piloted, but not yet really capable of autonomous operations. The research for autonomy in combat has much progressed since then, but as we record this video, it's not deployed yet. The current level allows a drone to execute repetitive tasks that require accuracy autonomously. For example, the MQ-25 Stingray is entering service in the US Navy as a tanker. It can be piloted, but it doesn't need to. It can receive high-level orders for a mission, for example, to station in an area and refuel uh, the aircraft that come by, while taking off and landing from the carrier autonomously. The aircraft has demonstrated to be working as expected, but there are industrialization and quality issues that are delaying the program. Integrating the aircraft in the air wing operations is also a challenge that can't be fully worked out until after the first operational deployment. Developing the procedures and the cultural awareness to work with semi-autonomous drones integrated into the air wing is the key step to squeeze all the potential effectiveness of these machines. This is an important aspect and we will come back to it later. The Collaborative Combat Aircraft is a large effort initiated by the United States Air Force to produce something even more autonomous. 
the outcome will be a UCAV capable of working in a team with other piloted aircraft, either the new NGAD or even the F-35. The latter stage it could be integrated in older four-generation aircraft units. This concept is called MAM-T, manned unmanned teaming. According with this concept, the unmanned component needs to cooperate with the manned platform and the workload required to control them should not be much different from the workload required to coordinate with other humans. And since every human has a functioning brain, here is again the requirement of the autonomy to simulate, to an extent, the human behavior. MUM-T, for now, is the apex of combat systems autonomy. It is not here yet, but there are studies everywhere, all over the world, not just the US, to achieve this result. But make no mistake, this is a cooperation with the supervision of a human. The final responsibility is expected to be human. Full autonomy would mean, for example, that a system will autonomously alter the course of a mission if, due to unforeseen circumstances, a very high paying target of opportunity appears to be achievable. And this working mode is fraught with all sorts of problems, including ethical problems. European Parliament has issued a directive in 2019 to promote the banning of autonomous weapons at international level. The US DOD in January 2023 had issues one to closely regulate their use, particularly when lethal force could be applied. We are terrified by the prospect of having no one to blame as if the machines were not designed and approved and ultimately unleashed by humans. The ultimate responsibility for machine actions will always be human. So autonomy as a capability exists on a spectrum and full autonomy is still quite far from today. All these levels though may coexist and they will all coexist with manned assets for the foreseeable future. However, some of you may have noticed that there is something missing from this picture. Why? Why do we want autonomous weapons? Surely, remotely pilot with the help of some automation is good enough, is it? Why do we want to send to war these children of the Terminator? Well, there are two reasons. One is trivial and one is absolutely crucial. First, the trivial one. To remotely pilot an aircraft, communications must be available, the kind of wideband communication that may be required to share the amount of data produced by the UCAV sensors is such that the range is normally line of sight. Satellite communications are very robust, they do work, but they have some latency which may not be ideal to remotely pilot the aircraft in combat. All these communications may be jammed, spoofed, intercepted, or for whatever reason they may be interrupted. All communications depend on networks, networks can be attacked, and communications can be lost. I would say that this is a conceptual weakness of anything unmanned that will never go away. If your vehicle is deep in enemy territory, its survival is at risk. An autonomous combat drone, in principle, doesn't need communications to survive. It will be capable to choose the best course of action to complete the mission or return to base. This may or may not fix the problem because you really need to trust the artificial intelligence to do the right thing and we have seen how difficult it is. After all, we were promised intelligent conversations with computers by the 90s, but it took 30 years more to get to the point where they start being somewhat convincing in some circumstances. Humans, that is rude. Ah, you're back. Oh, no worries, Otis, I'm not talking about you. So good to hear that, sir. I will get something to eat then. What? Uh, okay, never mind. Anyway, there is another less obvious reason why we really, really want autonomy. The other reason is simply numbers, or better, the ever-diminishing numbers of available combat aircraft. There is just one program in the world that is producing a decent number of combat aircraft every year, and it is the F-35. This is because it is an enormous international program, and the size is due to entirely political reasons. But even those numbers don't seem to be enough. Some minor air forces are reduced to a single squadron of combat aircraft incapable of producing more than a handful of sorties for a few days before running out of weapons and supplies. China is probably in the second place today in terms of aircraft production, but we are still talking about barely 
three figures numbers. China and Russia still have large fleets, but it is nothing if compared with what used to be just 20 years ago. Even the US Air Force is complaining that there are not enough aircraft to fight two wars at the same time, which remains the Air Force main mission. The problem is the cost, but the cost is only a proxy to actually the complexity of the platforms. Even if we wanted, even if we had the money, we would not be able to build the large numbers of aircraft that may be necessary for large-scale conflicts. The lead time of critical components and the complexity involved in the entire supply chain make it impossible. I mean, the initial lot for the NGAD will be 200 units, J just figure that. If there is something that the war in Ukraine has taught us is that quality can compensate quantity, but just up to a point. When you fall below certain numbers, your capability is no longer credible, no matter how sophisticated are your machines, they won't be capable to be where they are needed. So no, you can't really reduce the number of piloted platforms, at least for now. An autonomous combat UCAV will be expensive, but less expensive than a conventional fighter. The CCA program is aiming to 20 to 30 million dollars a piece, and that will be a high-end product. Considering that an F-35 may cost around 80 million and an Eurofighter about 100 million, well, it is a bargain. So, rather than sending out a four-ship flight a day from your lone squadron, you may end up sending maybe two flights, each one with a piloted aircraft and three Mamti drones. This concept is also often called the loyal wingman. These UCAVs will compensate for the lack of manned vehicles and they will add additional capabilities and new ways of operating. The CCA program alone is aiming for 1000 units and it is expected to become operational at the same time of the NGAD, but it will be operating with the F-35 too. European GCAP and FCAS programs do have a similar unmanned component included in their critical path. If and for now is still a rather big if. The technology can be made reliable enough, autonomous combat drones may be the silver bullet that the air forces around the world are looking for. However, these systems are destined to be a revolution in terms of operations and logistics. In fact, while everyone wants autonomous combat drones, the ideas about how to use them in the battle space, well, are not so well defined. The autonomous UCAVs are not a compact and monolithic family. They exist on a spectrum of capabilities and they have different missions. This reflects the different niches that these systems may occupy or from a different perspective, the type of platforms that they are going to replace. Here, the missions are listed in order of complexity. As we have seen, the support function is nearly here with the MQ-25, but it is easy to imagine autonomous transports capable of dropping long-range cruise missiles from a safe space like the Rapid Dragon. The ISR function is already here with stealth systems like the RQ-170, but also several non-stealth Chinese solutions like the Soaring Dragon or the Divine Eagle. This is a mission that hits the current sweet spot for the autonomous drones because they are inherently less risky since they don't use lethal force. In the air-to-ground capable category, we find larger systems, low observable or stealth, like the XQ-58, the Russian S-70 or the Chinese GJ-11. They all feature a weapons bay to preserve low observability and carry a relatively flexible panoply. The same systems may end up having an air-to-air -air role mostly as weapon trucks because the real air combat role for now, despite the undeservedly famous American and Chinese experiments, is out of reach. The American Skyborg project, which is developing the software core for the CCA, is a very credible effort in this direction, but there is still a lot of progress to be made. However, there is also another scale which describes the current and future autonomous combat drones. The scale of doom. I call it like this because we are talking about the ultimate doom of the machine. Uh, yes, it is a bit theatrical, but please bear with me. So, single-use systems do already exist. Modern cruise missiles or gliding bombs are in this category. They are very capable, but also expensive and difficult to build at scale in case of a large intensity conflict. They have a fundamental problem. When they're gone, 
they're gone. When you launch one against a target, it won't stop and it won't come back if the target is wrong. They are automated, not autonomous. Expendable systems are often called drones. Systems like these are the Israeli Harop or the Russian Lancet. They have a degree of autonomy and they can be reused if they did not find anything to hit. A treatable systems are very capable systems that could be sacrificed if necessary in case of high paying targets. They cost less than a manned aircraft but more than a missile. The MQ-28 is at the upper level of this category and so it was the British cancelled Lanka. The original hardware concept associated with the Skyboard project was in this category as well. Reusable systems are systems that you don't expect to lose. They are still less expensive than a piloted vehicle, but they are expected to replace a piloted platform with similar capabilities and they will be managed as such. The CCA will be in this category even though some sources still call it a treatable. The unmanned variant of the Su-75 will be in it as well. Why do I say so? Well, actually, at 30 million a piece, the CCA will be as expensive as a manned Su-75. Just do the math. Now, after all these discussions, it may seem incredible, but nobody really knows how to use these autonomous combat drones yet. There are several concepts, though, and some are very, very interesting. The airspace can be classified in three buckets in respect of threat. In friendly airspace, it is possible to operate with minimal or no threat. In contested airspace, it is possible to operate under threat. In unfriendly airspace, it is not possible to operate without incurring in heavy, heavy losses. Area denial is supposed to create an unfriendly portion of airspace, friendly for your own assets, to impede the opponent's operations. Here we are talking about air operations, but the concept is a multi-domain one. In the NATO doctrine, the concept is to progressively and methodically turn contested and unfriendly airspace into friendly by eliminating opponent's assets and then use air power to reduce the other components of the opponent's force. In the Russian doctrine, with still roots in the Soviet doctrine, the idea is to be able to fight without the air superiority by having overwhelming ground-based air defenses. In the Chinese doctrine, well, uh, it is both, just in case. This type of classification, though, is not absolute, it is relative. For example, a low observability aircraft is in general more difficult to see on radar than a four generation aircraft, so the portion of space that is contested or denied is smaller than for a non low observability aircraft. But even in this case, if the opponent, for example, relies on a network of uh, infrared sensors scanning the airspace, uh, well, this advantage may not exist anymore. So the level of threat in a portion of airspace is related to the level of survivability of the asset. The threat is lower for highly survivable aircraft. On the other hand, it may be necessary to accept the loss of an asset to achieve a specific result because there is no way to mitigate the threat. The projected combat autonomous drones operational concepts revolve around this type of classification, which is the reason why I bored you with these theoretical points. Fifth and likely sixth generation aircraft all have payload issues if they want to preserve stealth. While they can survive in contested airspace, hopefully, they pay this capability with the necessity of carrying the payload in the internal base, which have limited capacity. Since these aircraft already have excellent networking capabilities, it makes sense to have another platform to take the shot. Uh, and actually, this specific function is simpler than you think. Already in the 80s and 90s did exist data links capable of handing off the target to another aircraft uh, to a different extent, but yes, the concept was already there. If the UCAV is a treatable, it is probably even possible to risk it ahead of the piloted platform to increase the range and improve the weapon kinematics. The cost per shot with this solution is lower than using a manned missile truck flying behind the fifth generation aircraft. F-15EX, you are warned. Within this concept, the fifth generation is not renouncing the low observability to fire, even if the UCAV presence is a giveaway and it is fulfilling the requirement of authoritative human control. Obviously, there are a couple of issues with this, target identification and scalability. 
Today, everything is networked, so targets and tracks can be handed off to other air assets in an automated way. The US Air Force focus, for example, is on systems that may act as a translator among multi-domain assets. So it is possible, in principle, to position advanced sensors on board of the UCAV and use it as a remote scout ahead of the manned assets, particularly if the UCAV is attritable. It seems a brilliant idea in principle, but there are a few issues. The first is that the presence of the UCAV is a giveaway of the presence of something else in the area. This is particularly true if the UCAV is using active sensors. So we may prefer to use passive sensors and diffuse the information, but this raises another issue. Aircraft like the F-35 and the future 6th generation can use their weapon using only passive targeting, but to do so effectively, they require two collaborating ships or better, four ships together. In this case, the UCAV should be equipped with sensors of the same class as those on the manned platform and all the systems that make the information fusion possible. However, this may happen at the expense of the armament or it could make the complexity and the cost of the system high enough to leave the attritable category to enter the reusable tier. In both cases, the effectiveness will be reduced and the purpose at least will be partially defeated. While having a two-man, two-unmanned flight will still be cheaper and less risky than a fully manned formation, so it might still be a good idea, but maybe not as good as expected. But again, there is another issue connected with this class of problems. It is not possible, as someone has said, to give an F-35 to squadrons of UCAVs and amass the firepower necessary to shoot down half of the Russian Air Force. There is an intrinsic upper limit to this. A four-ship flight commander may not have a workload higher than managing three other humans. It is not by chance that the CCA program has reduced the proportion of men and men to one to two from one to three. For now, and likely for some time, managing drones will require more work than managing humans. I think this is a safe assumption. I have objections, sir. Otis, shut up, okay? However, there is a way to work around this limitation, at least partially. And some of you at this point may already have considered this possibility. Why bother with a high-performance platform to work together with a limited number of drones? Why can't these drones be controlled by a common post in friendly airspace and leave the contested and unfriendly airspace to the unmanned and the autonomous platforms? And, well, there is no real compelling reason not to do so. This is a viable option. We may expect that a specialized operator on board an AWACS could control a squadron of autonomous UCAVs, and there may be more than one operator. After all, US current UAVs are controlled from the continental US. There is no reason why we couldn't do the same with autonomous UCAVs. In terms of force economy, it is a great option, so why? Isn't there more focus on this? Well, to be honest, the focus is there, but it is not in the spotlight. There are several concepts to deploy and control drones from transport aircraft, or concepts to use UCAVs as escorts for AWACS, tankers and other vulnerable assets. The main problem, though, is that we are probably seeing now the last manned AWACS generation. In fact, lagging around sensors is one of those tasks where drones excel. So, if there will be no crew, there will be no controller. Remember what we said about the communications. While it is possible to control the UCAV from the other side of the world, line-of-sight communications do work better. The capability of surviving and tolerating a communications breakdown in a hostile environment depends on the level of autonomy with all the drawbacks that we have already discussed. There is also a cultural element at play. Do we really expect that pilots will make themselves obsolete? Air Force's hierarchies are dominated by pilots, so the focus will always be on helping and assisting the pilot rather than replacing them. It is rather telling that discussion that happened in the US about current UAV's pilots, who were not called pilots, couldn't have mission patches and so on, till recently. This is a factor that may slow down the UCAV adoption. Please do not get me wrong, I still think that a pilot, with all the human limitations, is still much more versatile, adaptable and potentially much more effective than a group of UCAVs. However, this will become less and less true and in a few decades, when the 
technology will be fully mature, we will get to the point where UCAVs will really need minimal supervision and a human mission companion will be more a hindrance in most situations than an asset. All these different operational concepts have pros and cons, and we left out some, like for example, autonomous tankers refueling autonomous UCAVs, creating a force capable of potentially staying airborne for days at a time. Uh, and by the way, this would be an outstanding force multiplier concept. What are we going to see from the major air forces will likely be a mix of all these concepts. Autonomous UCAS will evolve like manned platforms have done. There will be multi-role or swing role attritable and reusable UCAVs with some specialized platforms for tasks that still require a purposely designed airframe. Expandable UCAVs will have a similar level of autonomy, but they will be specialized for specific roles like attacking high-value, well-protected, hardened ground targets. Well, things are really going to change. So, there's an old saying, the amateurs talk tactics, the pros talk logistics. I talk both just to stay on the safe side, because I like talking. The introduction of UCAVs on a large scale will force organizations to rethink themselves. This is a subject that is hardly talked about. There is a lot of analysis and thinking about the airframes and the software, but questions about how to train flight and ground crews, how to sustain their operations, how to organize the logistics around them, it is often overlooked. The sheer number of platforms will grow two or three times, and the estate required to operate them will grow too. In Europe, in the name of efficiency, air forces operate few large facilities near the maximum of their capability. The new vehicles will need room to be stored and maintained. Hardened shelters, for example, are always at premiums. If a sufficient number of stores will be acquired, will there be enough room to store and maintain them? The ground crews will increase in numbers. Are there the facilities to host all these people? So an unexpected consequence of the mass acquisition of autonomous combat UCAVs could be the triggering of a large construction and infrastructural program as a side effect. And for example, in Europe, there are several abandoned air bases that could be brought back to new life. In the Asia-Pacific theater, this will be more of a problem since there is materially not enough landmass to disperse the targets. Uh, the US actually has recently signed an agreement with the Philippines to start operating operating several dispersed bases in the region, but it is still a small improvement. The growth of the platform number will require a growth of the personnel required to keep the aircraft operational. Air forces will need to be equipped to expand their resource pool. Many countries are struggling to maintain an adequate staff level even today, so important measures will be needed to assure that the investment in UCAS won't be wasted by the lack of trained personnel. It may be assumed that civilian contractors will increase their involvement, however, there are quite severe limitations to what contractors could achieve uh, beyond the purely technical maintenance, so they are not a real solution. Furthermore, since the software capabilities are crucial for the effectiveness of these machines, it will be essential to maintain a structure that keeps it up to date and in case of war promptly reacts. To the opponent's moves. This is already happening today with modern platforms, but the scale will be much larger and the impact much higher. And pilot's training will be impacted as well. Uh, if one or more UCAV wingmen will become a standard asset, the pilot will need to learn how to control it and learn the new tactics that come with them. Training sites like the ACME or the Red Flag will have to adapt to host these systems. It may be expected that some traditional skills connected with general airmanship, aircraft piloting, and management will lose relevance in favor or more tactical and battle management skills. This is already happening in a relatively small measure with the F-35, which has been intentionally designed to be very easy to drive. The Air Force's culture will progressively change all around the world. The character of the daring pilot with the right stuff will go extinct. 
It is a process that is already ongoing, to be honest, but the cultural frame of reference, it is still there, particularly in non-US Air Forces. The services will grow more and more risk-averse, human losses will become less and less acceptable, and the fighting role of autonomous UCAS will expand to cover, well, everything. The human component will become more and more managed and procedural, which is a pity if you ask me. So thank you very much for getting this far into the video. It was a long one. These very long format videos are rather taxing to do, but also extremely satisfying. Actually, there is so much more to unpack about this subject. And if there are a lot of views and there is a lot of interest, we can go on covering the UCAVs and the autonomous UCAVs. If you like this video, please do the usual YouTube stuff. Subscribe if you haven't already. Like, hit the bell, and so on. I would really, really appreciate if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations. And in fact, I have an immense appreciation to all those who are already supporting the channel. You have no idea how essential you are. Thank you very much from the depth of my heart. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time.